Welcome to the 44th Toronto International Film Festival. You lucky, lucky people. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spoiler Warning Podcast. This is our 2019 Toronto International Film Festival review of Uncut Gems. I'm Christopher Schneezy. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spoiler Warning Podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week in the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest film releases coming to a theater near you. The past two weeks, we have been recording episodes, um, talking about everything that we saw at TIFF this year. We are done. Yep. We're, we're on the last episode uh, might not be the last episode you hear because we might prioritize this one earlier in the feed, but it's the last episode we're recording. Recording. How does it feel, Stephen? Feels damn good, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad we made it. I didn't know if we were going to fizzle out or if we were going to really pull through till the end. Yeah, I mean, luckily some of these have been shorter um, yep. and required less work to get out, but still, it's a it's a daunting task of seeing recording. And releasing 14 reviews of uh, things that nobody else can see yet. Yep. But we were up for the challenge and we did it for better or for worse. Yep. I'm, I'm happy for it. Are you, are you happy for it? How do you feel now that we've survived it all? I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for it. I mean, I, I, it, because these are sort of rush reviews and we're often recording them in batches, they are shorter than normal episodes. Some only by a few minutes shorter, but they do seem shorter. Mm-hmm. I would be curious to see how a fresh review if we had seen this in normal release time would go um but i'm i'm happy for it. i mean like we made plenty of time for our joker review yep. um that one's definitely full length um with including with a spoiler segment that everybody can wait two more weeks before they listen to mm-hmm. um or be that person who listens to it anyways um but <laughs> um but uh but yeah i i'm i i, I feel good about it it's, yeah. it's this one fun. is gonna have a spoiler section too where i can go point by point through every score that happens in the gambling <laughs> use of this <laughs> yeah, film right because <laughs> i totally understand basketball yeah uh, we totally under- understand gambling and sports mm-hmm. and the diamond industry. Oh, for sure. Um, but yeah, what do you say, Stephen? We go ahead and play the trailer, which just released today for Uncut Gems. Oh, shit. And then uh, record a review. I can't wait. How you doing, Holly? How's it going? How's it going? Hey, Howard. Put Pesach out. All right, Larry. You're a Jew again. Welcome back. I made a crazy risk to gamble. And it's about to pay off. So I want the Celtics to cover. I want the Celtics halftime. I want Garnett points and rebounds. What do you know? I don't know. I just know. Well, I'll tell you what I know. That's the dumbest fucking bet I ever heard of. I disagree. I disagree, Gary. You're taking my money all over town, placing bets. I'm having very serious second thoughts. Are you serious right now? I know I fucked up. Howard, where's the money right now? Howard, got my money? Howard! Is it too late? I'm done. That means nothing. It meant nothing. Please. Give me another shot. You like to win, right? This is no different than that. Black Jewel power, nigga. This is my fucking way. You think I'm stupid, Howard? You and your whole fucking family. I heard you resurface your fucking swimming pool. I, you know how that makes me feel? Never resurface you think your life is more anything. I don't life. know who said that. I told you about how things were going to go. You like the way things are going now? That's my family! Get the kids out of the house! You having a good time? Yes. This is me. This is how I win. KJ, it's right. game night. You should be stretching out. Yeah, what is he, a coach? Nah, he's just a fucking crazy-ass Jew. 
All right. So Uncut Gems is the latest film from the Safdie brothers. And it is basically the story of this guy who works sort of in the diamond industry in New York. And uh, this man might have a little bit of a gambling problem. He might have uh, some people that want some money from him. But he has a plan. This man has a plan. He has imported this uncut gem from, where was it again? Somewhere. God, I don't, I don't want to guess. <laughs> I don't want <laughs> to guess, guess and be wrong. No. I want to say Ethiopian. I think there were Ethiopian Jews that had kept it alive. I believe that is that is. Yes. The Anyways, he he basically imports this uncut gem from far away. It is a an opal. A, is that the word? It is an opal. I, I think yeah, something like that. Anyways, it's this gem that he is planning to auction for a million dollars, which will allow him to settle all his debts. Um, but. As somebody who is, you know, maybe obsessed with gambling and maybe really bad at making decisions, he might have get himself um, a little over his head in a couple different situations. And this is the story of him scrambling to auction that opal and uh, pay off his debts. Yep. <laughs> Stephen Miller, what did you think of Uncut Gems? I think I love the Safdie brothers. <laughs> um, so Good Time was canonically both of our number one film of that year. I would have to rewatch it to know like if it would still hold that, right? Number one is always lofty. Like whatever you put at number one, you're no, going to no, feel kind of... It's Safdie. Safdie. <laughs> <laughs> Not lofty brothers. You got me. <laughs> um, and I, I went back like a month or something ago and watched Heaven Knows What, which was the film they made before that movie. And I love that one, too. And it, it was a similar type of film. With, it was following a, a person who lives in New York City who has a life that is not particularly glamorous. And it's kind of like showing in brutal detail what she goes through, setting it to a heavy soundtrack that makes it feel not uplifting, but makes it feel like a rush. Like it makes it feel like a rush to live these lives. Yeah. And I feel like Uncut Gems just follows that trajectory amazingly well, where this is taking a thing I knew nothing about. Like, I didn't even know the Diamond District existed. I looked it up later. It's, like, east side Manhattan. Um, but it's just, like, this block where basically there's all of these ritzy jewelry places, and you have the the shady people who are wheeling and dealing there, and th there's this world that you would never really know existed, but, like, there have to be people who, who own that place. And, like, what is the kind of person who can seem kind of schlubby like seem like they're not particularly well off who owns a place that has like very expensive diamonds you know like what kind of person can can wheel and deal in such a high stakes environment and i feel like adam sandler's character is just crazy in this movie and he is not likable in this movie at all nope. um <laughs> their safety brothers characters rarely are likable but i feel like he in particular is he has an ego that the other ones don't where he is a big talker and he constantly gets in his own way in this film. Um, and yet I completely loved it. I think this movie goes places. It builds to a crescendo that worked on me so, so well. And even though I know nothing about gambling, I know nothing about sports. I know nothing about anything about this movie. By the end, I felt like so invested in what the score of a game was going to be and like what twists and turns were going to happen. And it just... It just got me really, really, really good. And this was the very last film of TIFF that we saw, um, which is why it's also the last we're recording. We're trying to be mostly in order. Um, and even though I was so exhausted, I just felt this like rush leaving the theater. I, I was just so on board for what this movie is doing. Now, what is it trying to say? I have no idea. I, <laughs> and I, I know that's unlike me. Like, I should love a movie that is like a message film, a film that is like clearly about something. But I feel like this is just so direct and honest to this very, very, very particular character. And it manages to make you understand what the gambling high feels like, like give you that rush, that feeling of stakes, even when the stakes are a thing you put in your own way. Like the world didn't require that, but it, it still tricks you into feeling it. So yeah, I I love the gritty New York that they portray. I love the heavy soundtrack. I I love the crazy characters in this film who all of them are kind of assholes, right? Like Lakeith Stanfield is an asshole. Uh, Kevin Garnett, the basketball player, is like at least... Nobody is friends with each other in this film. They're all kind of playing each other and trying yeah. to see what they can get in the end. And it just worked on me. I, I was a big fan of this movie. Yeah, I, I mean, I so both you and me um, had 
uh, Good Time as our number one film of that year. And uh, we were both excited to check out Uncut Gems. Um, I, I can see and I appreciate everything you're talking about in this film. This film is technically no different than Good Time as far as like loudness, intensity, um, characters that are – you probably shouldn't root for, but you might want to root for. Who make very uh, poor life decisions. Yeah, yeah, who make terrible decisions. This is so close to that film, and yet I can't help but like it less than Good Time. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily anything in particular. Like, I appreciate what it's doing, and I did enjoy the film. There is something about just the existence of Adam Sandler. There is something about the cacophony of every scene. Like, you, you know, like, you, you joked when I said that, like, Sometimes it was hard to hear things in the film. And you're like, obviously, you don't remember Good Time because the music was also crazy in yep. there. But there's something about having the crazy th synth music plus 10 people in a very confined space all yelling at each other, having their own confined conversations um, that, that sort of just took me out a little bit from the film just because I was working so hard to – follow and pay attention and try to do it and it picked a subject matter that i literally care the least in the world about right sports and betting mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's it's the the way the film is told is very interesting and compelling but it follows a character i don't care about <laughs> who is played by an actor who I cannot see as just zip it to do <laughs> like, <laughs> every time he'd be like what I'm trying to pay my debts <laughs> I would just yeah, I, I just couldn't not see Adam Sandler playing Adam Sandler. Um, even though he's doing a role that is definitely not a very Adam Sandler role, just any time he kind of screamed or got upset or kind of yelled at somebody, it just felt like Adam Sandler. And it, it was hard for me to separate it. I'm totally willing to concede that, like, this is the 14th film we saw at the festival. I was exhausted. <laughs> um, I was having a problem with my knees throughout the whole festival. And this is a long-ass film which has a lot of stuff at the end that just goes on forever. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there, there, there was just something about the film that I cared less about than I – like, I mean, the difference between Good Times, the, the, both the brothers in Good Time and, you know, Adam Sandler and whoever else you want to include with him in um, Uncut Gems is Adam Sandler is never sympathetic. Mm -hmm. He's a shitty dude in this film and he doesn't really do anything that isn't shitty ever in the film and in good time no matter how bad the situation gets there is always the i'm trying to take care of my brother who can't take care of himself right there, there is just, some pure high motive even if everything between it is not pure yeah yeah and even though there's things that really creep you out in good time um, or situations where you're like, please don't go there, please don't go there, please don't go there. Th you are still rooting for them, and you still care about the end result of where these color these characters end. And when the film is finally like done and settled, you have just a fucking amazing credit shot where you just sit with the film, yep. and it's like that was amazing fucking film. Yeah, and I think that where you arrive at at the end of Uncut Gems feels like the culmination of exactly where you were headed towards the whole time. And you... I didn't care. <laughs> I, I mean, um, I, I definitely agree that this does not have the sweetness to temper it that Good Time did. Um, yeah. The credit shot is the perfect example. There's like a moment of respite after all the chaos that lets you just sit with it. And that is the thing that emotionally really resonated with me, the high yeah. note of Good Time. This is more pure, uncut Safety Brothers, yeah. right? This is like, we're not going to give you that this time. We are just going to give you a character where the the chaos is the rush, and that is what you're going to get, and nothing else. And it is simultaneously way more pure and direct a version of their style, and a little bit less sympathetic. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I buy that. Heaven Knows What is kind of in between. That one is a less likable character, too, I think, uh, than in Good Time. And there's not that much by way of sweetness, but it is more kind of inherently sympathetic, even just knowing the backstory of who is playing who. Um, yeah. This, again, it's Adam Sandler as a gambling addict who does nothing but get in his own way the whole time. Yeah, and yeah. I shouldn't love this movie. Like, it, it just, stylistically, it, 
it got me so good. And I've seen other gambling movies, you know, like The Gambler or Mississippi Grind. Like, they're all about the rush, the thrill of getting fuck you money, right? Like, the, yeah, yeah. the thrill of maybe finally getting it. None of them made... I, I, feel, I feel like this film is... He's never even dreams of fuck you money. He only dreams of paying off his debts money. Yeah. <laughs> well, he doesn't even care about the money. Like, like I think one thing in the film that... It, it never directly says it, but there are moments toward the end of the film that kind of hammer it home. Is like, this is a guy who he has a really nice apartment. He has a really nice, like, multiple really. Yeah, nice, I was gonna say he has two really yeah, nice. He apartments. He has two really nice apartments. He has diamonds in his building. He has plenty of ways to get money. It, it's the thrill of gambling, the thrill of beating the odds, that is the thing that he's chasing, and that is yeah. the destructive thing that is going to kill him in the end. Like, metaphorically, you can believe that if you want. <laughs> I, I wasn't even thinking about the actual plot when I said that. <laughs> uh, that That is the self-destructive thing that, like, is going to be his downfall. Um, and I think this is just such a, a pure adrenaline-soaked story about what it feels to be addicted to the chance of winning, even when you don't care what you win in the end. Like, if he cared... He would put in the time and effort to have an auction go well. He would put in the time and effort to, like, do all the real ways yeah. a man who sells diamonds could make a living. Um, but that's not what he's up for. He He's only into the rush of victory. And I I don't know why. It, it just worked on me on a level that other movies about gambling didn't work on me. Yeah, and like like I said, I don't, I don't not appreciate what this film is doing. I just found the subject matter and the characters... Um, kept a little bit of a barrier for me just being all in on this film. I do appreciate and I do feel the essence of the Safties doing what they do best. Um, and I really appreciate what they did. I just, it just, it, it doesn't hit me the way that good time did. Yeah. For me, I think one thing I really respect about them, and this is similar to like Sean Baker is another example of a filmmaker where they just highlight a, a group of people who you maybe would never even consider. And they're like, I'm going to make a whole movie that is about their life experience. And I'm going to put you in it. I'm not going to force them to be any more or less sympathetic than they are. I'm just going to trust that you will get out of it what you want. And yeah. I like, I honestly think that the Safdie brothers kind of put Sean Baker to shame in terms of like how far they're willing to go to really aggressively put you in, in the life of a downtrodden person. Well, I think too, that, what they're doing feels maybe part of that disconnect that I have is it feels insidery. Mm -hmm. They are not holding anybody's hand with talking about the diamond industry, nope. the gambling industry, or the sports betting industry, or I guess sports in general, right? Like yeah. they are just like, you guys know what we're talking about, right? And and I'm not saying this film would have been better if they kept taking time to explain how shit works. It's just one of those things where they were making a film that they thought was cool, which is what you should do when you make films. Yeah. So they they have literally committed no crime in yep. making this film. Yeah, they've done the dream. They're making yeah. exactly what they want to make. Yeah, they did, they did everything perfectly. Mm. They excelled 100% at what they wanted to do. I'm just not into what they were doing in this case. And that is literally my only complaint. <laughs> yep. I, I, I feel you. And, and I feel like this movie feels like a dare, like that they would make for each other. Like, I dare you to make this character, this situation, sympath not even sympathetic, uh, compelling. Like, I dare you to make a movie where people are going to sit and watch this guy. He He's basically like in, in any given episode of The Sopranos, there's always like the poor schmuck who like lost all their money and they kept borrowing from the mob and then we watched them just getting eaten alive for it yeah and you think like what what was in it for that character what made them make that life choice and this movie is like we're gonna flip it we're just gonna show you that guy yeah. and we're not gonna give you anything sweeter or gentler or nicer than that uh fun little bit of trivia do you know who was considered for this role before adam sandler signed for it uh do not know jonah hill had signed for it what yeah but adam sandler had been their first choice he just couldn't make it at first and then he could when they actually filmed the movie <laughs> so uh, think about that uh i would definitely watch the version of this with jonah hill <laughs> war dogs jonah hill basically just back with the same yeah with the same mentality <laughs> You can't beat perfection. I, I want to see it now. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a full-on Coke movie. I haven't used that term in a while, but this yeah. is this is it. This movie is Coke, and you you either are 
on board for it or or you're not i was so 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 on yeah. board cool um well should we get to verdicts sure Stephen Miller, if you were going to give us a must-see, recommend with a caveat, wait for rental, pass with a caveat, or a must-avoid, what would you give it? I think you should order a blade and fly over to the nearest casino and watch this movie on a big screen, because uh, this movie fucking slaps. <laughs> must-see. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> um, but yeah, I so this is one of those situations where it's like, my personal feelings aside, I would still probably recommend this film to people. Um, I I think it is good. It's just not – it didn't sit with me as well as I hoped it would and didn't have the empathy that I was hoping for in these characters. And I couldn't not see Adam Sandler. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so um, so my own personal feelings are a little tamped down. But unlike other films that we have reviewed um, recently, not part of TIFF, um, <laughs> it's, it's basically it's the opposite of Ad Astra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I – had a little less positive feelings of it because of personal reasons, but I still think it's good and people should probably still see it. Is that a recommend with a caveat? Uh, no, yeah, 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 recommend okay. with a caveat. Cool. Sweet. <laughs> we made it. Well, that is the end of our coverage of the 2019 Toronto International Film Festival and our review of Uncut Gems. Stephen Miller, if people want to find you throughout the week, where can they do that? People can go to twitter.com slash sdavidmiller or sdavidmiller.com. People can find me at ChristopherInRealLife.com or Twitter.com slash ChristopherIRL. You can find the podcast over at TheSpoilerWarning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so in Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. If you want to know the episodes go live, you can follow us at Twitter.com slash SpoilerWarning, Facebook.com slash TheSpoilerWarning, or Instagram.com slash TheSpoilerWarning. If you want to get a hold of us directly, you can send an email to fans at TheSpoilerWarning.com, or you can use the contact form on our site. That is it. We are done. We top five of the festival. Go. Oh no, can't do that yet. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you for listening to our coverage of our time at TIFF this year. Um, hopefully, you enjoyed it. We will probably do it again next year. Yep. Um, we'll see if we die before then. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks for listening, and we will see you in the next review. Bye. Bye. This is Canadian content. And it's time we take credit for it, starting now. Oh, Canada!